Welcome to the second event run by the Morris Federation during lockdown. And um, I'd like to introduce you to clog maker Simon Brock, um, who's based in Sheffield and has been making, there he is, waving at you, and has been making clogs professionally for about three years now, and mainly for step dancers and Morris dancers, but apparently not entirely. So that might be one of the questions you can ask him later. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Simon. Uh, Simon, could you unmute yourself? There you go. And I'll mute me. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you, Pauline and uh, Jenny and the Morris Federation for setting this up. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, delighted to see so many people who've, uh, who think this is a good way to spend their Saturday afternoon. Um, I hope I don't let you down. Uh, the idea of this um, little uh, session this afternoon I'm just going to show you around the workshop and talk through the stages involved in making a pair of clogs. Um, and then at the end, there'll be plenty of time for Q and A. Uh, so if there's anything I've missed or anything that you want more information about, then uh, just wait till the end um, for that. Uh, Cause I'll just be running through things um, pretty briskly from start to finish, uh, first of all. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's get going. We're going to look at how we get from the, the main components of clogs, which is wood and leather. Uh, and how they end up looking something like this, something that you can dance in, or indeed, uh, if it's your thing, uh, walk around in. Um, so we'll start with the woodworking. That's sort of where I tend to uh, tend to begin when I'm making a batch of clogs. I'll make um, a bunch of soles first, and then a bunch of uppers, and then put them all together. Uh, so this is the first raw material, um, the timber. Over the back there, we've got some that's in the round, um, which I sometimes use. Uh, increasingly, though, I use um, this, which has already been sawn. Uh, so these are boards at five inches wide, three inches thick. Um, which is about optimal for getting the, uh, the shape of a sole out of. Uh, and they're normally about four feet long because that's about the maximum length that I can swing around comfortably in the workshop. The timber I use is sycamore. Um, historically, uh, alder was used um, and also ash has been used, uh, for particularly for step dancing clogs because that's said to have a nice bright sound. And I do make the odd pair of ash soles, but um, 99% uh, of the clubs I make are, uh, are sycamore. Um, other timbers have been used in the past and continue to be used. So beech, for example, is used in machine-made soles. Uh, alder that I mentioned earlier on is probably the best wood for if you're entirely carving the soles by hand and more of that in due course. But I use a combination of machine tools and hand tools uh, and find that sycamore is um, a good compromise, if you like. It works well on the machines. It works well on the hand tools. It's also got, got a very fine texture, uh, so you can bash a lot of nails into it before it splits, which is obviously an important consideration when we come later on to putting the uh, leather uppers on. So um, without further ado, I'll take you through into the woodworking bit of the workshop. The first, uh, first step, in making a pair of clogs or making a pair of clog soles is to cut the cast. Uh, and this is an example of a cast, here's a size six. And that is um, basically, that's what the clog looks like sideways on. So the first step is quite straightforward. Get a piece of wood, work out where the optimal positioning for these um, soles is gonna be. So obviously that involves checking the wood for things like uh, there's a bit of pith there, so I'd want to be avoiding that. Um, there's a knot there, so I'd probably want to be a little bit careful about that. I do include small knots in clog soles, but if there's anything big that's actually going to impact on the strength or the longevity of the sole, then that gets uh, edited out, if you like, at this stage. So selecting around all the defects, there's a nice big knot right in the middle there, so I can probably get one, two either side of that, and so on. Um, and then we draw the cast on the timber. And so I'd obviously need um, two of those if I was making a normal pair. Um, and then there might be other sizes going down here. 
chop that out on the bandsaw uh, and you end up with a piece of timber that looks like this. So that's a, a cast that's cut. You can see that it's starting to look like a clog sole from the side, not so much from the top. So the next step, having cut the cast, is to cut the profile or the, the foot shape, if you like. So I've just got a series of um, templates made of stiff card. Uh, eventually they, they sort of wear out and they need replacing, but, um, but they do last quite a long time because it's a nice thick card. So we'll lay that on there and draw around it. So, so far, all you've seen me doing is draw around templates. And you're thinking, I could do this, I could be a clog maker, there's nothing to it. So we draw around the foot shape on there, and then that goes through the bandsaw again. Um, I debated whether to demo that, but really watching me push something around the bandsaw, it's just a bit noisy and frankly quite boring. So we'll leave that. Um, what I prepared earlier is here. It's not the same size, but it gives you an idea of, um, of what a sole looks like when it's been roughly cut at this stage. So you can see we band sold quite close to the line there, all the way around, and you get something that's starting to look a little bit more like a clog sole. So far, that's been fairly straightforward, just using the band saw and some templates. And that is really a pretty much the easiest part of the whole operation, um, which doesn't take very long at all. But then as you go on, it gets more and more complicated. The next step um, is just to just to tidy this up a little bit. So um, we go on to the disc sander, which again, I'm not going to fire up because it's a pretty unpleasant noise. Um, but that's just to clean up the edges of that roughly cut sole. So rather than a, a rough sawn edge, now we've got nicely sanded edges all the way around. You might be able to pick up on there that there's a little bit of a taper on the end of the sole as well, going like this. And that's the same all the way around. So um, that's just a little bit, just helps the sole look a little bit more elegant um, and also easier to dance in. Uh, so we've got the nice smooth sole at this stage and the, the lines that I've drawn on um, are to show where the grip will go. Uh, the grip is the rebate that the leather gets nailed into. Um, so at this stage I've drawn on where the grip's gonna go on the top and where it's gonna go on the side. Um, the other marks that I've made on here, are, there's a mark here that's going to show us where we want to waste out some of this excess material because obviously this is looking quite clunky at the moment. We're going to get rid of all this uh, and make it more streamlined. Also marked on the balance point, which is where the sole touches the, uh, touches the ground at the, at the furthest point forward. Um, that is also critical for reasons that I'll hopefully remember to mention later on. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so we've got a mark there to show how much of that material we're removing and the balance point. And what I'm gonna do shortly is, is, is cut out all of that material between there and there, which isn't really required. Uh, so you can take out an awful lot of material here without it compromising the strength of the sole because the grain here is nice and straight. It's only really when you get up into the toe and you've got the grain kind of coming across like this. You've got to be a little bit careful around there because the yeah, the strength of the sole at that point is not, not quite as good as it is down here. Um, so that's, that's most of the sort of first part of the machine processes done. Um, so we'll, um, we'll step through into this middle part of the workshop now. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is get some hand tools out. This is what you've really tuned in to see, I think to see whether I'm gonna chop my fingers off on the clog knives, uh, and I aim to disappoint you in that regard. Uh, so we'll have a look at those tools. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna be uh, cutting into this momentarily, but first I just wanna to talk to you a little bit about uh, clog knives. So these are the um, traditional tools of the clog maker's craft, and uh, if you've got Anyone who's got sort of remote interest in clog making as a craft will be familiar with these tools. Um, if you want to be geeky about it, they're all they all seem to have been made by by this guy uh, Carter of High Burton in West Yorkshire. Um, I don't think I've seen. I think there might have been. Yeah, I think there were other members of the Carter family who got involved in 
club knife manufacturer, but I've never knowingly seen one made by anyone else. Uh, and this is called the blocker, um, and it's uh, just kind of what it looks like, really. A big long blade with a hook in the end and a long curved handle with a little um, long sort of curved, curved tail to it with a wooden handle on the end. And that locates into a hook on the bench and then that gives you an enormous amount of um, freedom in terms of the angles and the, uh, and the cuts you can get. So I'm going to delay your gratification of watching me um, use that just a little bit longer. Uh, these are some soles that I've carved entirely by hand. And um, this was uh, some training I've been doing with Jeremy Atkinson. That's a name you might know if you're interested in, in clog making as a craft. Um, he doesn't make much for the dance market. So um, if you haven't heard of him or ever seen him at festivals or whatever, then, then that's why. Uh, but he hangs out in Herefordshire. Um, and about a year ago, I started doing some training with him. It was fairly short-lived because of coronavirus. Uh, having someone at close quarters teaching you how to use tools isn't really a um, social distancing friendly activity. But he uses these tools that I'm going to show you to make the whole thing from start to finish. And that's the skill, those are the skills that I've been um, brushing up on with him. Uh, day to day, what I do is cut, cut the soles, rough the soles out with the machinery in the way you've just seen and then use the club knives for a couple of quite specific processes for which they are probably the best tools for the job. But in the olden days, they would have just started with a block of wood and used this and perhaps the sole out entirely using hand tools. Also important to note that, that doesn't make them better clogs. It's just a different way of, of getting to the same end. So what I'm looking to do with the blocker is go from the balance point up to that point that we looked at earlier on and take out some of the waste. Probably need to stop using my best t-shirts for this. Okay. So then it goes. So that side's quite easy because I can see what I'm doing. Um, the other side, not so much. Because I'm over here and the lines I'm working to are over there. So um, that's a little bit more, more difficult. And just try and feel where that cut is going. Nearly there. Okay. So I've got those two cuts. I can enjoy myself a little bit now and just waste out some of that material in between. That's quite an efficient way of taking out a lot of material in that area and also leaving the sole very much more sort of streamlined and elegant looking than it was before. Um, maybe just take a little bit more off this side. And then another little detail that I like to do um, is just to nick these corners off. So that just again sort of visually lightens the sole a little bit. Um, also means you're less likely to catch the uh, catch the end grain on on anything. And I don't know. I just think it's a nice stylish little touch. Um, so that's that's all I routinely do with the blocker. As I said, I am working towards being in a position where I'm going to be making soles entirely by hand. Um, when when I can pick up the train with Jeremy Atkinson again safely, uh, hopefully get to that stage. I think hand carving is an important part of the craft to conserve uh, for its own sake. Um, 
but um, like I said, it's it's not that it really makes makes clogs better. It's just that these are craft skills that need to be preserved, and there's not a, not many people around who are in a position to to do that. So the next stage is um, oh, we're getting we're getting close now. We're getting something that looks a little bit like you could um, probably put your foot on it, but you would find this surface pretty uncomfortable because it's just flat at the moment. Uh, and so the next stage is to try and scoop some of the wood out of there and hollow that in such a way that it's more comfortable for the foot to sit on. So tool number two. Is this one. The hollower. Um, again, made by Mr Carter. Uh, and that is a sort of compound curved. Um, I think, yeah, well, it's, it's curved in this direction here, and then there's a slightly curved um, bevel ground on it as well. So it's ideally suited to scooping wood out. Works in just the same way. And the, the point of it is we're trying to make the top of the surface of the sole fit near enough uh, the last. So um, that's the wooden uh sole uh, sorry the wooden foot shape that we're going to see more of again later on um so that at the moment you can see is kind of cockling around on there not very convincing we want to get to a stage where that just sits nice and snug on the top surface of the sole so off we go There's a few cuts there, just to begin with. That just hollows out a little bit for your heel to sit in. And then the main cuts are to um, hollow out where the ball of the foot and the arm sits forward. Enjoy myself a bit too much here. If you just want to go and do something else for half an hour, and then, uh, come back to me in a bit. It's taking a bit of material out there for where the outside of the foot sits. So a few, few passes there. By no means finished, but hopefully. <laughs> The last is already starting to sit a little bit better on there. And um, a little trick that uh, Rick Rubitsky taught me, more of him and on, um, is if you um, scribble a graphite stick on the bottom of the last, then wherever it touches, the sole leaves a dark mark and it shows you where you need to take out more material. Okay, so we get in there. Um, hopefully you can see in the right light, there's a little bit of raised material there. Uh, it's not exactly right just at the moment, but that'll just support the arch. Um, obviously there's more material to come out all of these places where we've got little dark marks. Um, I don't propose to, to finish this because otherwise it's not time for anything else. Uh, just gives you an idea of how you get there. And uh, I can't really think of any more effective way of doing this bit of the process. I mean, if there was a quicker machine machine-based way of doing it and doing it right, then I'd probably be quite interested. 
but uh, it's just I think it's probably just the best tool for the job really. So last thing, when the last is sitting down nicely on there, I'd just like to take a little bit more out for the ball of the foot and for the big toe. So I think sometimes those can can't really see what's going on there, can you? But uh, the ball of the foot and the big toe are sometimes points where you can feel the pressure on plug soles. So just try and take a bit of extra material out in those areas. Um, and I'll keep working on that until that last sits down nicely on the sole without rocking around at all. Um, and the other thing is that it should sit without any effort. It should just, you know, come to come to rest between those lines that I drew on earlier on, which is where the grip is going to be. Um, and if we get to that stage, then we know that the last is going to sit right on the clog sole when we come to last it up. There are some further machine processes, again, noisy and not particularly exciting to watch. Uh, and eventually we end up with something that looks rather like this. So that's the finished sole. You can see I've put the grip in, that's the rebate that the leather will be um, nailed into later on. The traditional way of achieving that grip was with this. The gripper, so that's the third of the clog knives, um, and it's just a, a fairly. Um, well, I was going to say it's a fairly rough and ready V gouge. It's actually not. It's actually ground very precisely, specifically to do that job of putting a rebate on a pair of clog soles. Um, so you'd use that tool to make the rebate in the olden days, or if you were carving entirely by hand. Uh, quicker and slightly more accurate to do it with a router, so that's how I do it. Um, and then a bit more sanding, clean that up, give it a varnish, uh, wax polished finish, and that is a completed sole. So we're done with the soles now, I think. Uh, and we can step over here and have a look at the other part of the process. Simon, yeah. before you move off the soles, you've got yeah. a question. All oh, right, uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, oh. I uh, the question from Gerald is, are you using dry seasoned wood or green wood? Uh, it's, it's dry. I dry it for about six months um, because it's behaved from the machines then. Um, so it's not as easy to carve. It's easier to carve green, definitely. Um, and if I was carving by hand, I'd want it as fresh as possible. Uh, but this combination of machine... Of, putting it through the band so put it through the band so when it's wet and there's any stresses or anything in the timber then it can bind up on the blade and and make life quite miserable so i um i use it dry and then as long as the clog knives are really sharp they, they seem to be able to cope with the dry sycamore quite well i hope that answers your question gerald okay you've got a second question okay which is from allison uh, who says those tools look terrifying so much leverage have you had any accidents? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> uh, the, the worst injuries I've had in here have been one from the copper, the bit of copper wire in, on the inside of an extraction hose. Um, two from uh, a drag knife, which is the thing you use to trim rubbers. And once when I was sharpening the clog knives, um, but Touch wood, there's plenty of it around. Um, I've never yet injured myself whilst using those tools in anger. Um, and actually, uh, if we just nip back to the bench. Um, yeah, they do look scary, but as long as you, you know, don't have your hand uh, downstream of the cut, they're, they're not that dangerous really. So if I'm cutting here, I've got my hand just cradling the, the heel. Now, even if the sole suddenly just flipped out of the way and disappeared, it wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't cut the hand. And that's a principle I always use when I'm on the bandsaw as well. Pushing wood through the bandsaw, I never have my hands in front of the blade. I always imagine if someone took the wood away now, would my hands go into the blade? And if the answer is yes, then I'm doing something wrong. So um, it, it's quite possible to work safely with, with all the tools including the clog knives. And I think by now I've just got so used to working with them that um, 
there's, there's very little chance, I think, oh, it's a stupid thing to say, <laughs> that I'm going to do myself any serious harm on them. So, uh, But thank you for your concern. Uh, Jeff has asked, are the clog tools replaceable? Um, yes and no. They, they, um, there's a surprisingly large number of them around, um, which I, when I was first getting into clog making, I, I sort of thought they were like hen's teeth. Um, and they're, they're not, you know, they don't turn up every car boot so, but there are quite a lot around. So if I ever got through these, if I ever sort of sharpen these to stubs, um, then I do have a spare set. And then if I sharpen those to stubs, I could probably get my hands on another set. Um, I know someone who collects them. Better not say who he is in case his wife's watching, because I don't think she knows about his habit. Um, <laughs> So there's, there's plenty of them out there. Uh, they're not replaceable insofar as I did at one stage look into having some made and went to a few tool makers and a couple of them were so somewhat interested in making a blocker, but no one would go near the hollower. Uh, and I'm not a metallurgist, but my understanding is that the metal that the cutting edge is made from, I can't believe it, I've just nearly cut myself there. <laughs> um, the metal that the cutting edge is made from has a very high melting point and the metal that the handle is made from has a low melting point and there's a very small window of opportunity if you like where they're both at their melting points where you can forge them together so it's not just one piece of metal this is one piece and then the cutting edge is another piece that's forged onto it um, obviously the curves are quite complicated as well so there's there's a lot of um, complexity to them more than uh, more than most people would be interested in getting involved in as a little project. So that was a bit of a long answer to a short question. They're not replaceable with new ones, but there's there's not a desperate worldwide shortage of, of old usable ones at the moment. Okay, thank you, Simon. There's one final okay. question, but yeah. you may want to leave this one till later. Um, Carol has asked, can you show us how you sharpen the clog knives? Um, but if that's too yeah. long, then no. I, I mean, I'll. Um, I'm not going to demonstrate it if that's all right, because I did sharpen them just this morning ahead of this demo to make sure that <laughs> they, look, they looked impressive. Um, but uh, just the same way that you would sharpen any other tool, you're just working down the grits or working down the coarseness of. Um, I used to use a diamond stone at one stage. Jeremy showed me this stuff, which is aluminium oxide paper, um, self adhesive. So you just stick a piece onto some plywood and then you've got uh, 800 grit, 1200 grit, and that's 2500 grit. So it's just a case of sort of tool there and, and, you know, just using these like you would a whetstone, I suppose. Um, so the coarse one and then the medium one and then the fine one. It's quite a nice edge on. And then I've got a bit of um, a bit of leather on a paddle. Um, that you spread some auto sole, you know, the chrome polish, uh, spread some on there. And I can do this because this won't happen. And then that just polishes the edge. So, um, yeah, that answers the question. So that's how to sharpen them day to day. I mean, when I first got these, they were in quite a, um, in quite poor condition. And it involved more or less a day on each on each knife um, with a belt sander. Uh, I know it sounds a bit agricultural for, for, for such old and rare tools, but it was the best way of doing it, just to sort of scour them back and take out all the pitting and get them back to some sound metal again, and then gradually sort of work up a, a good edge on them. And now it's just a case of maintaining that edge. And they do hold an edge very well. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what this steel is, but. It's certainly better than what my, you know, chisels and planes and that sort of thing are made from. So we've got another question for you now, Simon. Yeah. Uh, is do you know whether clog makers in other countries use the same or similar tools? Um, well, Gerald, uh, who asked, asked the question earlier on, would probably be a well placed to, to answer that, but. Um, they, um, the, the block knife is, the blocker is, uh, yeah, I think um, like Dutch, Dutch clog makers would use something 
similar to this, not exactly the same, and the French likewise. Um, but I'm not sure about, I don't think the hollower you would, and, you, and the gripper probably not either, because the thing that makes British clogs um, not absolutely unique, but pretty unusual, is that they are, you just have a wooden sole and then a fully enclosed leather upper nailed onto it. So it looks quite a lot like a normal shoe. And if you think of clogs from other countries, you know, the Dutch, Dutch clogs are the ones that spring to mind. Even for most people in this country, if you mention clogs, they just immediately picture the, the girl in front of the windmill um, with the big pair of Dutch clogs on. They are fully encased and they're made entirely out of wood. So you wouldn't be able to get a hollower in, in that sole in the same way as you can. You certainly wouldn't be able to get it right into the end of the toe. So they have a, a series of other uh, even more impressive tools, actually, for, for boring out um, you know, the Dutch. If you watch Dutch club makers at work, they have these massive kind of auger things that they use to, to scoop the wood out right into the, if you imagine that club and, and getting the wood out right into the end of the toe, that's quite a tall order. Um, so there's a, an awful lot of skill and, um, involved in using their tools. But they look somewhat similar, but they're not exactly the same. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Gerald's given a very short, short answer that says, we only use a smaller block knife. Yeah, is that what I said, roughly? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gerald. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Okay. Any more questions on the uh, clog knives before I press on? No, no more at the moment. All right, good stuff. Um, we can go back and have another look at them later. Uh, so these are the um, yeah. The next stage is to make a, a leather upper to um, to nail onto the sole, uh, and these are the components of a standard lace up upper. So if you're into shoemaking, that bit's called the vamp. Those are called the quarters, and these are the counters. Um, no, that and that end up getting stuck together like that. Uh, you will note that. There are some holes cut out here. Because this is quite thin leather, I've also lined it on the back. Um, and those holes are to take the eyelets. So we set the eyelets and then go through a series of processes to assemble the upper into something that looks rather more like that. Um, so the sewing machine I've got is over here. This is a Singer 29K, um, which uh, is a great machine for making clog uppers and the foot turns all the way around. So if you have awkward, um, awkward shaped uppers to stitch, you don't, you're not, you don't just have to stitch this way, you can stitch that way, you can even stitch backwards and stitch that way, etc. So that's really useful, particularly sometimes when I'm making the, the heavy leather uppers, it can be quite difficult to sort of manhandle them and get them sitting down under the foot. So the fact that this thing can stitch all the way around can be really useful. Uh, with this soft leather, it, it's not so important. But So that's the machine. Um, I think it's from about 1940, something like that, and still going strong. Um, use that every day. And, yeah, that's what, it's, that's what a finished uh, upper looks like. You see the lining has been stitched in there. The counters have been stitched in. So that's the outer counter. And then the inner counter there is the bit that sort of hugs your heel while you're, um, while you're dancing. Uh, and then the whole thing is stitched together, quarters stitched onto the vamps. And there we are. And the... Um, the, this is a Gibson upper. They're already quite sort of foot shaped, even at this stage. So uh, that makes lasting quite quite straightforward, because it's it's already you know it's wanting to become a shoe um, without much convincing. So the next stage would be um, to get the leather wet. Uh, so just uh, dunk it in a bucket of lukewarm water for. Uh, anything from about sort of 15 minutes for the, for the thin leather up to maybe three quarters of an hour for the very thick stuff to get it nice and pliable. And then 
<clears throat> this is where the, the components come together. So we've got a solve, we've got an upper, bring back the lasts from earlier on. Um, so I'll pick the right size last. And the last will sit on the sole. Um, a bit of a gap there, so pack it up. That's better. Jen, if you're watching, that was for yours. A bit of packing. All right. Um, so, yeah, the, the last sits down on the sole, and then the upper, wet upper, goes on there. Stretch it down with the last pliers, and these guys, uh, and pin it in place. Um, and I'm not going to show you this bit because uh, it's the bit that's most likely to go wrong. Um, and it does, it can be a little bit time consuming as well. But I can show you one I did earlier. Here we are. Um, quite a fancy pair, actually. They've, they've got pyrography on the edges of the soles and crimping on the quarters as well. Um, so you can see there we've got the uppers still sort of a bit rough and ready looking. Um, stretched down over the last, there's the last inside, and pinned in place. And that'll stay that way until the leather is dry. I only did these yesterday afternoon, so I'm going to leave them till the end of the weekend. But what I would then do is stick this bit of rod in here. And you, um, if you leave with that, you, you sort of, it's called breaking the last. It doesn't mean you're breaking it. It just means you're doing that with it. And the last then becomes a shape that you can slide out of the finished plug. So we go from this where you've got this extra sort of skirt of leather. That's obviously where the where the leather's been pulled down with the last pliers, and you need that extra bit um, in order to stretch the leather over. You can see it's taken the shape of the last really quite nicely. Uh, this last has been slightly modified. So um, a lot of the time, people don't quite fit into a standard size, and then you just got to build the last up so it resembles their foot as closely as possible. Um, so this, for example, this is someone who was a size nine plus a little bit. So we've got a bit of leather tacked onto the back of the last. His foot didn't quite sort of fit the, the shape of the last. His little toe was rubbing here. So pinned a bit more leather on here just to back out the last in that, in that area. A um, bit, uh, bit of gaffer tape over the top just to sort of smooth out the, um, uh, the discrepancy between the leather that's tacked on and the last itself. Um, yeah, so the idea is to make the last as much as possible resemble the foot of the individual customer. So that's um, when you're getting into the realms of, of custom fitting. And that one is too, that's a little bit wider than standard. So that's got some little bits of leather tacked on. And then after that, um, still with these lasting tacks in, then trim the leather so that it is flush with the grip, the rebate. So at this stage, we've got no excess leather and all of the leather is sitting down quite nicely into that rebate. And we've very nearly got a finished pair of clogs at this stage. The only remaining thing to do is to finally nail it up with the nice nails. So we go from this stage where we've just got the lasting tacks in, uh, and this obviously is uh, the the last stage where you apply a welt, that's that strip, um, leather strip that goes all the way along and just sort of hides the um, join between the wood and the leather, uh, helps to keep the clogs a little bit more watertight as well. And we've got brass nails in around the toe, as is traditional, and then steel nails in around the back uh, and a nice shiny toe tin on the front. And that is it it's just as simple as that uh we've got a few um finished or almost finished clogs here uh so obviously most of um uh what you will see if you see me at events i'll have a big table full of mainly black clogs at the english events um because most english step dancers and most dancers want black um but there's other colors too uh 
purple is always popular. Those are the styles. So these are some big derby boots for a chap who lives on a narrow boat and he wants uh, he wants to be kicking lock gates open with them and just generally sort of clumping around and pretending he's a Victorian possibly, I'm not sure. Um, but I know that they need to be nice and chunky for him. Uh, so that's a good boot style. It's made with some three and a half mil thick edge tan leather, so they should last him a long time. Something a little bit left field um, that I've been playing around with are these leopard print ones. They're made with a hair on cow hide. Uh, so you've you've got to handle them really to truly appreciate how um, tasteful they are. Uh, and yeah, the T bar as well, that's another just another different style. Uh, these are some patent leather tea bars. Um, these are destined for Wales, uh, as indeed typically are most of the more outlandish clogs. Um, the Welsh just have slightly more adventurous clog tastes, I think, than the English. <laughs> Discuss. Uh, and there, there's class clogs as well. So they're the more old fashioned types. Instead of having laces over the uh, instep, they just have a little clasp. Um, so that's a really, a really old fashioned sort of Victorian style, really. Uh, but I think it looked quite smart, really. Um, probably do a revival. Uh, nearly done. Um, <laughs> so they're all made the same way, whether it's the big old Derby boots. I've been making a few of these little ornamental clogs uh, as well recently. So just tiny little Clog size three, that's a, sh a children's shoe size four. Not even sure if a child with feet that small would, would be walking. Certainly wouldn't want to put them in clogs personally, but there we are. These are for ornaments, um, not for real children to wear. Uh, but they're all made in the same way. They all start with the block of wood. They all go through those processes that you've seen, the bandsaw, the sanding, the clog knives, even the little tiny ones. You know, even there, I've, I've used the blocker to take out that excess material down there. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it really. Um, I can get a little bit geeky about uh, balance points and um, how to make clogs more suitable for dancing and that kind of thing. Uh, if we're, you know, running out of things to say to each other. But I think it's probably as good a time as any to ask if anyone's got any questions at this stage. If, yeah, uh, there's, there's a oh. few questions uh, for you. Uh, uh, from where do you obtain the lasts? Ah, good question. Um, well, there's um, a couple of places left that still make them from new. Uh, Springline in Northampton being where I get mine from. But the lasts that I've got here are actually from Rick Rubitsky, which is a name um, that uh, few of you will probably be familiar with. He had a shop in Tomberden until the 90s and um, I tracked him down in retirement uh, and eventually persuaded him to part with his uh, such clog making uh, paraphernalia as he had left. So he sold me the last um, a set of clog knives which I mentioned earlier on. I've got a spare set, that's, that's um, a set that I got from Rick. A lot of patterns some old nails, some old totems, uh, a couple of old pairs of clogs, and his, well, part of his personal archive as well. Uh, so I was really pleased to be able to um, obtain all that stuff from Rick, because anybody who has ever had a pair of his clogs seems to hang on to them, um, even when they're falling to bits. Uh, I know his clogs have got a really good reputation, so um, I'm pleased for that to be part of my pedigree I guess uh, to have to have Rick's stuff so yeah the last I've got all came as a job lot from Rick okay so somebody asked about uppers um they said is it veg tan leather but I suppose the question is do you do non-leather uppers um well veg tan uh yes some of it is the um these, for example, so these are these are undyed veg tan uh, originally, which is this stuff, uh, which has been dyed black. Um, so 
I would use that stuff. It's very thick. It's like three and a half mil thick. I'd use that stuff for if someone specifically requested it. I would use that from from Morris clogs as well. You know, the um, I've not got any examples to show, unfortunately, but the traditional Morris clog has a, a, a seam at the back, which it's not sort of stitched up with with counters like this. It's just the thickness of the leather butted together and then stitched through the thickness of the leather. So if I'm making a pair of those, I use veg tan for that. The rest of the time, it's mainly mineral tanned. Um, and I do have now just just sort of got round to perfecting them. Um, well, that might sound a little bit arrogant. Uh, oh, um, got round to to making them so that they look as nice as the as the real leather ones. This is a, a vegan alternative. Um, so I'm not uh, not entirely sure what it's made from. Um, it's called myco something. So I don't know if it's made of mushrooms. I hope so. Uh, yeah, so some veg tan, some chrome tan leather, some pig skin. I use pig skin for the linings because uh, it's nice and thin. So I'll line the, um, around where the eyelets are with pig skin. On softer leathers, I line the toes so that they will hold a better shape. Yeah, when, the clog's, when the clog's finished so the toe doesn't collapse. Um, and vegan if you want it. So a variety. Okay, next question is, do you manage to get a supply of clog irons or are they still in short supply? Um, uh, yeah, I've got a few, but um, uh, there's, there's a few there that, uh, oh, look at those cobwebs. <laughs> um, there's a few that I got from Rick uh, and that, that's all he had. So I'm kind of a little bit loath to use them because um, they're not, they, they bring me luck hanging up there. Um, but yes, I've got a couple of boxes, uh, but they are the old ones. Um, so I haven't got a supply of clog irons from, from new any more than anyone else has. I think everyone now is, is at the stage really relying on, uh, on what old stock they can find at car boot sales and eBay and that kind of thing. Okay, the next question is, or well, there's kind of two that may be similar. Um, mm -hmm. How do you measure up for a custom clog and then how do you make any adjustments to the sole for a custom clog? Um, measuring up, well normally uh, I try and convince people to to try real clogs on. So I either come here, I'm in Sheffield, so that's quite quite convenient. You can get to Sheffield quite quickly from a lot of places, so people are happy to, to come here. I had a customer drive, drive it from Essex a few months ago. Um, and that's the best way to try try real clogs on. And then a lot of the time, um, you know, three quarters of the time, people will just fit into a standard size. Um, if they don't, then at least when they've got that real pair of clogs on, you can say, okay, well, where does it, you know, where is it wrong? Oh, it's too short or my big toe's touching the end or whatever. Um, and sometimes it can just be as easy as that. It can be someone trying on a size five and saying, yeah, this is great, but I need a little bit of extra width. And then that's a really easy thing to, to do. For anything more complicated, I um, probably got some examples here. Um, I draw around the foot and take a couple of measurements, one across the widest part of the foot there and one over the instep. Um, again, that in conjunction with people trying on real life clogs wherever possible. Um, but that's a bit of extra information if someone has uh, feet that, that don't fit standard size. Um, in these coronavirus times, people coming to the workshop is not, um, well, I don't think it's really even probably legal just at the moment. No one's been for ages. Um, so people are sending their own drawings, which is fine. And it works most of the time. Um, we see a little bit at the mercy then of someone's own drawings and their own measurements being correct. Uh, and even more recently, um, I've had quite a few orders from overseas where people have uh, drawn their feet, scanned them in, sent them across, given me, in fact, I think I've probably got an example of exactly that. Oops. Um, yeah, so this one, for example, this was from the USA. Chaps drawn around his feet, 
given me the measurements, is then said that from that point to that point, it's 280 millimetres. So I can then scale that up at my end and print it out at the right size. And then I've effectively got the foot drawing um, as good as if he had handed me the piece of paper himself, but he's in America. Uh, so I can make his clothes and send them over there with, you know, being pretty confident that they're going to fit when they get to the other side. Uh, and I think the other part of the question was in terms of sort of shaping to the sole. Um, that can be a little bit awkward. So if people have particular requirements for, you know, extra height on the, or extra support on the uh, arch and that kind of thing. Um, what I've done in the past is people have sent me their orthotics and I've tried to replicate those on the sole as, as closely as possible, which seems to have worked a couple of times. Um, because the flexibility of those hand tools is possible to do that. So if someone sent an orthotic, I could just kind of look at that and think, right, you know, I'm trying to carve the shape of that orthotic into the top of the sole and hopefully provide them with the same support as they would expect from their orthotic, but within the wood itself, if you see what I mean. Um, or you can allow more room inside here so that someone can wear an inner sole or an orthotic or something like that that they're used to. So you just provide them with a standard sole. They then put their own bits into and you provide them with a little bit more height or a little bit more space inside the clog so that their, their toes aren't um, coming out the end, if you see what I mean. Does that answer that question okay? I think so. I hope so. Yeah. Got one more questions, Simon. <laughs> okay, I'll try and be a bit quicker with the answers then. <laughs> no, that's all right. That's all right. Um, not necessarily in the same order, but I thought this might be a quick one. With what do you paint or stain the sole edges? Um, it's just a wood, a black wood dye. Uh, and then afterwards it's sealed in with an exterior varnish and, and waxed. Um, and uh, that's... Uh, here. <clears throat> so that stuff, it's not a particularly informative label, is it? Black light fast stain. Um, but it's a spirit-based spirit stain that's designed for, for dyeing wood. Yeah. Uh, so it's, um, yeah. All right. Next. Next one was uh, this might take longer. I'm interested to hear about balance points. Oh, good. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, uh, there's a lot of debate, I think, about soul shapes. And um, as anyone who's followed my story will know, uh, Trevor Owen was very. Um, a very important mentor in the early stages of me doing this. Rick Rubitsky has also been instrumental in um, passing on his knowledge and has been very generous with that. Jeremy Atkinson more recently as well, who um, has a lot of thoughts about souls. And the, the idea is that the soul should, um, let me think, well, when you're walking in a clog, the, the sole doesn't flex. So you need to be able to get all of the action needed to walk comfortably by the sole sort of rolling like this. Uh, and if it doesn't do that easily, then they're not comfortable to walk in. So the thing about the balance point is it needs to be far enough back that when you tip your foot forward, the clog comes with you instead of being left behind. Because if it's left behind, then you're either relying on the laces being tied over your instep to bring the sole with you, if you see what I mean, or you're slopping out the back of it. So um, what I reckon is that you should put, be able to press down on the sole where the ball of the foot is at this end and get quite a lot of travel at the heel end without putting much effort in. And that translates to when you're walking, you can roll forward quite a long way on there, almost sort of to the end of your step, if you like. You're not going to lift your foot much higher than that off the ground when you're stepping, without it then starting to pull on the other part of the clog. So the, the sole should allow you to do that. That's partly about the balance point. It's partly about the, um, the shape of the sole forward at that point. And I think it's important for walking, that you can walk easily in them. Um, but... I think it's also important for step dancing um, because in a little step dancing I've done, which um, is not really fit for public consumption, but uh, 
when you lean forward, you want to be able to get up on your toes, don't you, without too much effort. And again, um, the roll on the saddle there and the, and the position of the balance point and, and so on is all part of that equation. I've got an old pair here. Someone's just left with me for a bit of service, but um, I'm not sure what the provenance of it is, but it's kind of an example of, of the opposite of that. If you press down there where the ball of the foot is on those, they're not going anywhere at all. Um, so I can only think that they must be very difficult to walk in. And if they were for step dancing, that shape of sole would be very difficult to step in. Uh, where's a pair of mine? Oh, these are all right now. Yeah, there we go. So you press down where the ball of the foot is and they, they kind of walk around quite easily. Um, yeah, so that's all a whole, you could probably write a doctorate on all of that. <laughs> so someone's asked about uh, what designs do you put on the leather? Do you have your own specific design and then do um, custom ones or how does that work? Yeah, the... Um, uh, when I first started, I didn't really have a, a standard uh, crimp. That's the name for the for the um, design that you put on the leather. Um, but I did a pair for someone that had this leafy pattern in, and that that had so many people then asking for that that I thought, well, maybe that's my crimp. So it's quite different from the more kind of traditional crimps that you might come across, which are variously sort of flowers or shields or cross hatching or um, yeah, roses and straightforward sort of geometric lines and shapes and things like that. So that's my standard design. If you can't think of what you want, but you know you want something, then you get that. Um, otherwise, yeah, just whatever you want, really. I mean, within reason. <laughs> uh, and um, as a, a gentleman from Australia who wanted a pair of Morris clogs, which are, they're on their way there as we speak, um, and he wanted something that reflected where he lives now in Australia and, um, um, and where he had lived previously. Um, and all of those elements kind of went into a crimp that looks like a traditional crimp, but it's not. It's a design that he and I sort of gobbled together between us. So I thought that was quite nice. So a lot of the time, yeah, I just do whatever, whatever I'm asked to do. So it really is bespoke, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, right, so Maddie's asked, when did you decide to become a professional clog maker? Um, it's just over 10 years ago that I started um, down that road uh, when I first met uh, Trevor Owen at Whitby Folk Week in 2010 and um, was very interested in uh, what he was doing because I trained as a furniture maker so I already had a woodworking background and I was really interested in the souls initially. Um, so I went, stayed with Trevor for a week all that time ago, and he showed me how it was done, which was a um, very generous thing to do and sort of set me on that trajectory. And then went away and taught myself leatherworking and did leatherworking for a few years, and then finally came back and put them together. And I think it was 2017 when I picked it back up again. Um, and initially uh, I was just doing two days a week in a friend's workshop and just trying to hone my skills and make clogs that were something like saleable. I wouldn't like any of those to come back to me now, uh, those early pairs, because I think I'd probably feel like I'd con people into uh, buying them in the first place. Um, so uh, yeah, the clogs I make now have certain certainly more finesse than they did then. Um, and then I moved into this place in early 2018, I think. Yeah, uh, so this is a little workshop in um, Shalesmoor area of Sheffield, which is quite nicely, this is where the, sh where the boot making industry used to be in Sheffield. Um, and the clog makers were all kind of bunched up at, uh, about half a mile away, but, um, uh, I can't remember what the question was now. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so the professional thing, I just sort of went for it, you know, early 2018. I thought, well, I've got to kind of do this properly or not at all. So I started renting this workshop and went to, went to a few festivals and things. And, um, yeah, um, that, that was that, really. So it's 10 years ago since I first got interested in it and probably about three years ago 
since I thought I need to read, I need to go back to this and you know really uh, um, take it seriously and, and relearn the skills that I once had and learn the new ones and put it all together again. Yeah, fascinating. Do you, um, Jeff's asked how long does it take to make a pair of clogs? I suppose it depends what they are. Oh, I hate that question because <laughs> 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 it's it's really difficult to know um, because I don't just make a pair of clogs. I make, I make them in batches of between six and ten pairs, depending on depending on the number of factors. Um, and I also do leather working as well uh, in between times. So it's 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 hard to know. I think it's like a pair and a quarter a day, or a pair and a half a day, or something like that. If I'm at it full tilt, it's probably more than that. Probably yeah, about a pair and a half a day. Um, but it's it's, it's difficult to know for sure. Um, I did sort of time myself making a pair, but that was years ago, and I'm, I hope I'm a lot faster than that now. <laughs> uh, so, a bit of a politician's answer for you there, I think. Yeah, I guess it's hard to know. Um, what some uh, Jeff's also asked, what proportion of sales are rest of the world compared with the UK? And I suppose I've got a question, how many also are for dancers or not dancers? <laughs> Um, yeah, so in terms of how the work split up, um, overseas orders, uh, maybe 10 percent. It, it was none at first, um, but yeah, it's quite it's probably a little bit more actually. In fact, just at the moment, it's maybe more like 15 15 percent um, rest of the world. And rest of the world is not necessarily where you would think. Uh, so it's not Europe at all. I've never sent a single pair to the to continental Europe, but the USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all the places where the British have been and people do Morris dancing or British style step dancing. Patagonia for a couple of pairs over there for um, the Welsh enclave. Um, St. Petersburg and Moscow seems to have a very vibrant uh, British, I'm not sure whether they do English style or Welsh style there but a uh, step dancing scene, um, surprisingly. And I have to say, I'm not being paid to say this, but the Russian Postal Service is excellent. Um, uh, but, and then the, the balance of uh, sort of who I make the clogs for, uh, if you'd asked me this last year, I would have said probably 90% for Morris and step dancers combined, and 10% for people who just want them as everyday, uh, everyday shoes. Um, but sorry to put a bit of a downer on things. Uh, the pictures change quite a lot um, because of coronavirus. I've not, not been able to get to any of the events that I would normally expect to do. And that's where I sell stock and that's where I pick up orders. So at the moment, it's about 50 50 um, civilian and dancers. And that's not because the amount of civilian orders has increased, it's because the amount of uh, the number of um, orders from dancers has dropped off a cliff this year. So um, if you think you might want some clogs for next year, I've probably got work till about the end of January. Um, but if the events are cancelled again next year, then uh, I might not be doing this for too much longer. So if you think you might want a pair of clogs for next year, then um, the sooner you can place the order, the, the longer I stay in business. And then when all the coronavirus has gone away, I'll still be here. Obviously, if nobody orders any in the meantime, then, then I won't be. Um, so that's the, that's the split at the moment. But ordinarily, I would expect a good 80% to be for dancers and, and the rest for um, everyday wear and a uh, little bit of theatre work and, and the, the ornamental ones and, you know, sort of oddities like that. So we all need to take up clog stepping if we're not already doing that, don't we? Yeah, and if you're already doing it you and you have only got one pair, then you obviously need a spare um, for when they uh, wear out. And um, uh, yeah, uh, people need to keep ordering them, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone needs a purple pair, surely. Definitely, so. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think there's um, a lot of people probably don't realise it yet, but they want the leopard print ones. Yeah. Uh, they are beautiful, aren't they? <laughs> um, maybe patent hot pink is your thing. Ooh, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> or try them, try them as footwear. Um, because uh, pe people people do like them for that, and obviously, as I've got more orders that are just for um, everyday footwear, I've got more feedback about that, and people seem to really like them. Um, mm. And there's a, a chap actually, I must give him a shout out if he is here, uh, who lives in Western Australia, who's just received a pair, um, and if he's tuning in, it must be like four o'clock in the morning or something. <laughs> so I'm really impressed. He said he was going to. Uh, and, you know, he's just giving me the feedback that they're really comfortable. Someone last week said they were the best shoes she's ever had. These are people who are wearing them as everyday shoes. Um, I wear them. I'm wearing them now. I've got a sort of best pair that I wear for the pub. Uh, so that's a possibility. If you do it, if you, even if you're a step dancer or a Morris dancer, then you probably need another pair for um, just looking cool and I think that's what Jen Cox has just said. The number of pairs you need is N plus one, where N is the number of pairs you already own. So, yeah, <laughs> that's about right, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, can you just explain about rubbers and irons again, how you, how you put um, attach the rubbers? And somebody asked, they haven't seen irons before, so perhaps you could just show them? Yeah, um, yeah good question. So... Um, Rubbers, uh, they start out life um, as sheets. Uh, so this, this is the stuff, and you can probably see from the sort of ghosts of the, of the parts that have been cut from there, that um, they are cut into these sort of horseshoe shapes. Um, and yeah, fairly good example, there we are. Um, that they're actually some of this uh, sort of tire tread stuff, which I uh, I favour for the everyday clog. Um, not ideal for Morris dancing because it's not as hard wearing as the as the hard rubbers that you used to, um, but it's a lot more grippy um, and quieter as well. So you can sneak up on people if you've got that on your clogs. Whereas if you're wearing Morris clogs with that on, sneaking up isn't really probably a priority. Um, so they start out life as sheets, they then get bashed out into those horseshoe shapes on the fly press, which is a bit of kit that I've not really talked much about. This is a, um, a sort of giant pastry cutting machine, really. Um, I've had these knives made uh, to the shapes of the rubbers. You put the sheet under there, you put that on the top, you give that an almighty swing, and then you give it a few more almighty swings and eventually it kind of powers its way through the rubber sheet and you end up with a horseshoe shaped piece of rubber. Um, that is then... Uh, that's nailed on using this thing. Um, so, pop the clog over the end of there and then you've got a hard surface that you can hammer onto. Um, so just hold the camera there. So you get the, the rubber that's cut, plop, plop it on there, and then nail it in all the way around. Do the same again for the heel, albeit with a little sort of D-shaped piece on there. And there we are. That's, uh, that's how you attach rubbers. Attaching irons is exactly the same. Um, well, it's not exactly the same, it's nearly the same. But that's what they look like. Uh, this is a worn, a worn iron, but um, you get the idea. Uh, so again, you'd, you'd stick that on there. On here. And then nail through these holes into the sole. Um, so there's still a few Morris teams that insist on irons. Um, and yeah, I've got, I've got some, as per previous question. Um, but that's how, they're, that's how they're attached. And this thing is, um, this item is sort of crucial to that operation really, because you can just slide the plug on there and then like I say, a nice firm surface to nail onto, rather than being kind of, bouncing around everywhere. Okay. Okay. I think there's, this might be difficult as well. This, uh, what's the kind of price range for a pair of clogs? 
Um, depends. Yeah, uh, they, typically um, about 100, depending on the size, between about 130 um, for up to maybe 180-ish for a, a sort of all singing, all dancing pair of Morris clogs that's got the crimp and the overtone and the bells and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so that's sort of, that sort of um, price point. And uh, Jen Cox, who clearly loves her clogs, she said, um, do you have any other standard or typical non-dance styles? Um, You've got the boot there, haven't you? Um, yeah, uh, there's the boot, there's the clasp ones, um, which we had a look at earlier on. Uh, I mean, you could dance in those, people do. Um, no, I can't think of any others. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the tea bars, uh, I think, uh, yeah, probably um, as a bit of a uh, sort of cop-out answer is to say they could all be, they could all be non-dance clogs and they can all be non-dance clogs um, very easily. I mean, if you took those and put some of that tyre tread rubber on the bottom, then you've got a pair of clogs for walking around in. But I understand what you're saying, sort of styles that you wouldn't know, you wouldn't want to dance in. Derby boots, class clogs. That's about it at the moment. I keep toying with the idea of reviving some of the more obscure styles like the um, flap and buckle clogs uh, that used to be used in wet industries like uh, um, breweries and, and fish uh, processing um, factories and that kind of thing. Uh, just because no one knows what they are anymore, if, if you see what I mean. They're, they Cloggers and industrial footwear is almost passed into history. And if you could revive some of those more, more um, esoteric styles, but put a bit of a modern spin on them, I think that'd be quite an interesting thing to do. Fortunately, I never seem to have the time to do that because I'm always either just sort of churning out the orders, which is great. Uh, that's what puts bread on the table or kind of working on, you know, crazy ideas like these, um, which hasn't really deviated much from the standard Gibson. I've put a bit of broguing on it and stuff. Uh, this is a prototype, which is, it needs, needs a bit of re, reworking. Uh, so it could be a little while before I get around to reintroducing any of those um, mm -hmm. old styles, but it's something I want to do eventually. Yeah. The um, Jenny Rudge has made a comment. She says they're very cheap for the amount of work that goes into them and a lot of love and care and attention. I added that bit. Thank you, Jenny. Was it £25 we agreed for that? I think that's what you are, I know. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah uh, I, I quite agree. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I know I've got a friend who makes shoes just up the road and his starting point is kind of double that. Um, yeah. And I don't think there's particularly any more work in them. It's just people are more used to paying quite a lot of money for handmade, bespoke, fitted shoes. Clogs have always had a bit of a sort of poor man's footwear reputation. And it is a little bit difficult to move away from that too fast. Um, I keep trying to increase the prices a little bit. Uh, you know, I kind of broke the £100 ceiling quite quickly. Um, and I offer a lot of extras, which puts the price up a little bit. So you can have quite a basic pair of clogs for, for very little. But if you want, you know, pyrographed edges and crimps and, and your, your name on them or, you know, a penny in the heel or whatever. <laughs> you know, every time you add a little extra, then that obviously adds a bit to the price. Um, so I'm obviously all for encouraging people to, to do that. Um, but yeah, and it's a difficult one because uh, if I charged a lot more too soon, people would just stop buying them from me altogether. So it's a little bit about trying to change perceptions almost and make people think of clogs as, um, as being more like a bespoke pair of shoes rather than what they have been in the past, which is sort of mass produced industrial footwear. Um, yeah, so, well, thank you. I'm glad they seen reasonable anyway putting prices up next week as a result of that. <laughs> uh, question from Shelley says, how do you, and you did cover this a little bit, but how do you go about becoming a clog maker? Is there a formal apprenticeship available? And is there a guild for clog makers? 
Um, there's there's nothing uh, really in place. Uh, you know, you couldn't go and do a two year HMD in plug making or anything like that. There's no, well, I say that I'm certainly not aware of it. If there is, then I wish I'd done that instead of uh, doing it the hard way. Um, so as far as I'm aware, you, yeah, there's no sort of formal training, which is probably why there's so few people doing it, because it is quite a difficult thing to get into. You obviously have to find yourself a mentor who is willing to put the time in. Um, I've had three, you know, Trevor mainly, uh, Rick Rubitsky to, to some extent, and um, Jeremy Atkinson more recently but they've all been sort of ad hoc apprenticeships uh, with a sort of distance learning kind of aspect of them if you like so it's just a case of trying to churn out some clogs somewhere and then get someone to check them and say these are awful um, you know go and do the following and they might be half decent uh, I was at a dis, uh, sorry. I was at an advantage because I had had formal training in furniture making, so I wasn't remotely phased by working with wood or, you know, setting up machinery and that kind of thing. Um, and leather working, I taught myself. But again, by the time I came to put them back together in clog making, I'd be doing that for sort of seven years or something. Um, so it was another material that I understood. Uh, so if anyone wanted to do it, I think it would be good to have one or both of those sets of skills before you even start, really. Um, otherwise, I think it will be a very, very steep learning curve. And then in terms of the practicalities of how to learn, um, yeah, just find such existing clog makers as are around. There's still a few active ones, obviously leaving one of them, and um, a few retired ones. And... Uh, sort of try and try and get yourself mentored by those people I guess I've had a few people approach me both about sort of formal apprenticeships which I'm not I'm not in a position to do that I've not been doing it long enough myself um really to be to be offering that kind of training to other people um a couple of people who I think wanted to come along on a more informal basis again I've turned them down because because at the time they're asked, I was, I've been too busy in things. This year I'd have probably said, yeah, go for it, let's go for it, but we've not been allowed to. So um, um, so I've not personally sort of tutored anyone really yet, but I dare say the time will come. Well, uh, there may be an offer from Trevor Owen here in the chat. It says that uh, he could maybe offer apprenticeship to anybody who would like to take him up on him. Well, on that, do you want to unmute yourself, Trevor? Just say a couple of words. A couple of words. <laughs> or maybe a few more. <laughs> okay. um, I retired some while ago, a couple of reasons, but I still have hopefully some knowledge. Uh, I still have a complete workshop with all the equipment, basically the same as what Simon's been showing you during this talk. Um, I am perfectly happy, coronavirus, coronavirus um, aside, to teach anybody, as I taught Simon in the early days. Um, Simon hasn't mentioned that he actually made a DVD of me teaching him, which must be lurking somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, I think Hannah's got that. Yeah, Hannah probably, yeah. Um, so there is a record of it anyway. But certainly if people want to pick what brains I have left before they addle totally. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to pass on whatever I know. And as I said, I've got a complete workshop with all the equipment still. Uh, even though I don't use it, it's going cobwebs currently. So for your, uh, tell them where you live, Trevor. Okay. Uh, I'm doing cricket in Gogolchamri. I live in Northwest Wales on the Llyn Peninsula. 20 minutes south of Snowdon. Um, that's probably about it. It's a hell of a place to get to, as Simon will explain to you. Um, and obviously, currently, with various health issues, and that's even though we are not locked down like you are, I can go in the mountains tomorrow. Um, I, anyone just contact me. Uh, my website is still up somewhere with email address, etc., on it. So you can drop me a line, or I think there's a phone number on it as well. 
or something and probably slides it lurking around in a back pocket on a scrubby bit of paper. Um, just get in touch and go from there. Thank you, Trevor. Um, okay. I think a couple of people said they're quite interested in new clogs, Simon, so that sounds positive. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> And um, very easy to find. <laughs> yeah. And someone said, yeah, in Sheffield, it's quite easy to find. Yeah. And somebody's um, wondered if it would be worth putting on your website the instructions for how to measure your feet as they can't, you know, it's, it's difficult to get to you at the moment. Um, yeah, I could put that on the on the sort of landing page. What normally happens is when I get an I do have a sort of standard set of instructions. Um, so anyone who contacts me and says, I'd like a pair, um, particularly at the moment, because no one can come to the workshop to try them on. I'm sending everybody that set of instructions at the moment, unless they already have a pair of mine and know that they fit, um, or I've already got their patterns if they're a custom fit and so on. But for all new customers, the first thing I do when I get that email inquiry uh, or phone inquiry or whatever is just to, to ping those instructions over. And uh, that's, yeah, that's the first part of the ordering process really. Well, I think I think we've reached the end of the questions, and that's about Bob on because we said half past four. So uh, yeah. yeah, so it's gone quickly, hasn't it? No, it's absolutely yeah. fascinating, Simon. I'm so glad you did this talk because I've never seen the process uh, before. And um, I wonder if people could unmute themselves and give Simon a round of applause. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> Really good. Hey. 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 Hey.